Oh, Jesus. And if you missed the first two episodes, you can go to my YouTube channel, channel Sin City Preacher, and those are, are posted on. So um, we're going to pick up where we left off now, but I'm going to give you a real uh, short recap of what we've discussed so far. Let me close my door here. Hey, Brother Ronnie. I'm going to introduce you all in just a second here. Um, okay, so we've been talking about who Jesus is, and we've, we've already learned that Jesus himself, he personally actually claimed to be God. So uh, if you ever thought that Jesus never claimed to be God, watch the, the earlier videos and you'll see where he claimed to be God, he claimed to be equal with the Father, and in fact, that's why the Jews wanted to stone him and kill him, uh, because he claimed to be God. And we also went through um, uh, the first chapter of Hebrews. Uh, if, if the audience, if you've never um, uh, read the book of Hebrews, particularly the first chapter, you should read it because the entire chapter is dedicated to telling you who Jesus is. And he is, in fact, God Almighty, uh, manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, and if you ever thought Jesus was an angel rather than God, this is what the Jehovah Witnesses uh, This is totally refuted in the first chapter of Hebrews. It comes out and just says as clearly as it be, he's not an angel. Okay? So he is God Almighty. He claimed to be God. And now we're going to move to a part where Jesus uh, is on trial. And uh, Eve, do you want to read that? For what verses did we agree to read here? Uh, Matthew twenty six sixty four through 66. Okay, why don't you read those and then we'll discuss them. Okay. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you read verse 63? No, you, you started with 64. I want to read 63 first. With verse 64. Oh, sorry. It says, Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. So here Jesus is on trial. There's life. He's asked directly by the leader of the, uh, the, the Pharisees, the Jews, the, the high priest, Caiaphas. And Caiaphas asked Jesus, tell us, are you the Son of God? Jesus answers him, as, they, as it says there now. Some people watching may be KJV only, but uh, I'm going to read this, his answer, uh, in a couple of different translations. It says uh, in the KJV, uh, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now that's the KJV. Uh, when we look at the NASB, it says, Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. And then in the NIV it says, Yes, it is as you say. And then here's a paraphrase in NLT. It says, Jesus replied, Yes, it is as you say. So, uh, as much as I like to use the KJV, and as much as uh, many in many verses we cite where the KJV has it clearly uh, stated better than any other translation, and that yet in this case it's a little foggy. The KJV, and the KJV says, "Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said." Now, to me, what does it mean when someone thou hast said? 
I think KJV is not translating it the same way the NIV and the NLT others do, where Jesus clearly said, yes, it is as you say. Okay, but regardless of whether you think the KJV expresses this clearly enough, we have Jesus claiming that he is indeed the Son of God, Christ, Messiah. And then the chief priest tears his clothes and says, we've heard enough. He's, he's, he's guilty of blasphemy, worthy of death. So the point we're making here is that throughout Jesus' ministry, we cited many examples of him claiming to be God. And they several times were about to stone him for it. And then in, finally in his trial, the reason he was killed and crucified is because he answered that question from Caiaphas, are you the son of God? Jesus said, yes. Caiaphas says it's blasphemy. He's claiming to be the Son of God. He's worthy of death. So anybody who believes that Jesus never claimed to be God has not really studied the scriptures because that's exactly why he was killed. Now I'm going to open it up. First, uh, we started the show a little differently. I, um, I didn't introduce the panelists, so let me do that now. And then I'm going to ask each panelist to give me their reaction to this. Okay? Uh, we have Eve Whale. Is it, how is it pronounced? W-A-L-E, Whale? Yeah, um, it was just, my last name's Whalen, but I just put that for a YouTube name. Oh, okay, so oh, it's Eve Whalen, Whalen is her name, but let's just call her Eve, and her YouTube channel is Eve Whale, E-V-E-W-A-L-E. Yeah. -E -E. uh, and then we have, uh, this is Brother Ronnie uh, next, and his channel is Hood Minister. Uh, and then we have Jay Byron. His channel is Jay Byron, and uh, his name is Joe. I like to call him Brother Joseph. <laughs> and then next we have Mecca Wing Zero. Uh, this is a, a young college student, a great young saint. This is Jackson. Finally, there's me, uh, the, uh, Brother Luke. Uh, my YouTube channel is Sin City Preacher. So if you're watching this uh, broadcast now, I hope that you will uh, subscribe all of these YouTubers here. Now, let's go on and discuss this. Uh, uh, Eve, since you, I, I can't see if you're waving, I'm going to assume that you want to say something about this. Um, well, I do have something to say. I, I know that the priest did see, um, <coughs> see it as blasphemy. Um, you know, Christ has said that uh, hereafter he would see the Son of Man coming in the right hand of power on the uh, clouds of heaven. And um, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, that is how God the Father came um, as well in judgment. So I just wanted to bring that up. I think it was Isaiah 91 or Isaiah 19. Okay. Very good. Um, do you have any... Uh Anything to say about the various translations, the way it's phrased, or is it? Um, I don't know if it, I don't want to turn this to a, into a KJV only uh, um, topic uh, because well, I, I'm going to mention I've, I'm going to mention several verses throughout this study where a KJV has a verse that the other the modern translations don't even have, or it's diluted and, and ruined. So, um, but in this case, this is a, a verse where I'd say. The KJV is not clear enough on this, uh, as uh, I would like. Yeah, I, I do think it is a little bit vague. Um, it, you know, it, it's kind of saying, well, you're the one that said it, not me. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, I see what you're saying there. Hey, uh, Luke, can I go ahead and read it? I found that verse, Isaiah 19.1. Yeah, please. Um, it says, Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its mist. And that's one of many verses in the um, Old Testament where the Lord came upon a cloud. So clearly uh, the priest seen him as saying that he was uh, deity and the Father, or he, he is God. So that's I just wanted to bring that up. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's very good. Uh, I've got to click on my chat section here. Let me see. Okay, I've got it going now. Well, by the way, if anybody notices any chat comments from anybody, uh, then uh, bring it to my attention if I ever look at so that we can uh, maybe answer people's questions. Okay, next we have uh, Brother Ronnie. Do you have any uh, opinion on, on this 
what we've discussed so far. Okay, you have to unmute your mic. Ronnie, we, we can't we can't we can't hear you. Unmute your mic. Go up to the top right part of your screen and point to the microphone that has a cross to it and click on it. How's that? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Thank you, brother. <laughs> okay. I'm a moron at this stuff. Uh, I argued with a guy for like four hours yesterday. <clears throat> Loving players, but by the end of the day, I was ready to punch him in the mouth. Uh, sorry about that. But this reminds me, I mean, Jesus is, is God. He, he claims he is God. If we go to John 8, 58, uh, Jesus the Lord says, uh, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. If we go back to Exodus, uh, where is it? Three or no? Yeah, three thirteen. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Lord your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is thy, what is his name, and what shall I say to them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel. I am have sent me unto you. Hey brother, uh, we're, going to go over, we're going to go over those verses and many more throughout this whole program here, one at a time. So, but oh, okay. would, you, would, you, would you comment on the verse that we just brought up right now, this one about Jesus' trial? Do you have anything to say about that? Well, uh, I know that uh, the Jewish high priests would tear their clothes when they thought it was blasphemy. Um, and and the answer he gave, I'm not quite sure how that runs. So, can you read it to me again? I don't know the, the scripture you guys were on. Okay. So Matthew 23. Could you read the whole those three verses again? Got them in front of you. Read them in the uh, NIV, if you will. Do you have that? Uh, you want? You have it in the NIV. Are you wanting me to, Luke, or? Yeah, because I already closed my Bible up. I have to go back and find it. Okay. Oh, hold up here. That's Matthew 23. What, please? It's 26, oh, okay. uh, 63 through 66. Thank you. You're welcome. Do while you... we're looking that up, while we're looking that up, Ronnie, I'm going to come back to you. I want to get uh, uh, Brother Joseph here to comment on that, and you can find, read it again after he's done talking. Go ahead. Well, Brother Luke, uh, I can't tell you how many times that I've lost uh, good friends over the King James only version uh, uh, way of thinking. I even had a video uh, that I posted uh, kind of challenging that. Uh, so we, we do get uh, kind of hard-headed sometimes. But uh, in the King James, I noticed that a lot of times uh, a translation is not as effective in English as a transliteration, where they give the thought without giving the exact wording. And uh, this is a good example of that. Uh, a transliterated thought uh, tells you what it says without being trying to find the exact words to exchange. And so uh, regarding the, uh, the, the verses itself, you know, every time I read this passage, this section of the passage, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, I could so easily have been uh, Caiaphas or the the uh, one of the uh, uh, priests who denied Christ. Uh, we get so hard headed that we we don't see what's directly in front of us, do we? Uh, they were, you know, obsessed with the law and obsessed with propriety, and here's this guy who is a, basically. Uh, uh, Shaking their foundations, shaking everything they believe in, kind of like uh, attacking the King James only people, saying, "Hey, maybe we can look at other versions for certain things." And uh, you know, I could see myself going, "Hey, wait a minute! This guy's going against everything I believe in," and and closing my mind to the fact that this could be God incarnate right in front of me. Uh, I kind of feel sorry for. Him. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I think uh, I'm getting a little feedback here. 
Uh, I don't know if you need to turn your volume down or whatever, but uh, yeah, that's a very good point, and I think that's very, very introspective of you. And, uh, a lot of people ought to. Uh, I've said many times that I think one of the problems among the uh, the saints is that uh, we're too hard on each other. We don't give each other enough grace in terms of. Uh, uh, even those of us who are grace believers who believe salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and then it turns out a brother disagrees on KJV or some other subject, and, and then all of a sudden we're, there's a division in, in, among us. We should be uh, we should be much more tolerant and gracious to each other. So yeah, I think it's a good idea to be in respect and say, wow, maybe I could have fallen, um, not seen it either. But uh, how about uh, Jackson? Jackson, you, you you have an opinion on this section? Um, I'm kind of trying to formulate one, to be honest with you. I think we're looking at verse 24 of Matthew 26, right? Uh, no, I think it's 60, 64 through 66, isn't it? 64, excuse 63. me. 63. You wanted me to start at 63. Oh, yes. but 63. Yeah, okay, so I, I am looking at the right section. I just said the wrong. You, do, you um, have it there, do you have it there in front of you, Jackson? I do, I do. It's yeah. like um. You got an NIV. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm looking at the NIV, and the NIV says. Um, would you, you re would you read it to all of us in NIV? Because I know that verse 64 in the NIV. Got 63, 64, 65. Is it also 66, Eve? All right. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Read so. it. Read it. And Ronnie, Ronnie, you're gonna read it now. Go ahead. Okay. So first, verse 63. This is the NIV. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to them, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Okay, verse 64. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to you all, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. 65. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. And then verse 66, it says, What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Okay, let me see. I, uh, I have the NIV here, and it says in verse 64, uh, quote, Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. That's NIV. I think you were reading NASB or something else. Well, oh. no, because I have the NIV, and it says just as he said as well on Bible Gateway. It says you have said so. Okay. I'm All right, well, that's physical surprising. Physical NIV. It surprises me because I've got a, a parallel Bible here, and they're all side by side. Uh, but uh, So this version of the NIV is different than your version of the NIV. That's weird. Okay, but the, the whole point is that uh, when when Jesus had it during his ministry, he claimed to be God. I mean, on two occasions, I said they were going to stone him over. And then eventually, at the end of his ministry, when they captured him, put him on, arrested him, put him on trial, the issue was, as the high priest said, are you the Christ, the Messiah, the Son, the Son of God? And Jesus replied that he was, and the Caiaphas, the high priest, said, what more do we need to hear? We heard it from his own lips. So this is blasphemy, and now he gets the death sentence. So anybody who doesn't believe that Jesus claimed to be God, and well, all you got to do is look at his trial. Okay, Ronnie, why don't you comment on this, these verses here, and then we're going to move on to the next verse. Well, i got a nice little, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I got a nice little uh, annotation under here. It says, I adjure thee by the living God. This statement put a man on his oath and compelled an answer. The high priest was seeking, seeking an, ad, an admission that could be the foundation of a charge of blasphemy. Thou hast said means yes. And buffeted means punched. Like I wanted a buffet to do yesterday. You know? <laughs> uh, Very good. Very good. Those are very good. Good footnotes. Verse 68, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Verse 68 is a sarcastic demand to be told the names and identities of those who are strangers to him. It's a sign of supernatural. No, never mind. We don't go that far. Okay, now, 
All right, very good. We're gonna, unless someone has anything to add on that, I'm going to move on to now John 17.5. I'll read this verse, and then we'll discuss it. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, what is so important about Jesus praying to the Father and saying, with, glorify me with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Well, he's, uh, he's showing that he was glorified in the Father before the world even was. Okay, and there's, there's two very important principles I want to come out of this. Anybody have an idea? Well, he was pre-existent. Uh, uh, he was uh, uh, pre-existent with the Father prior to the existence of the world. Okay. The two things, and then you can, I'll ask you guys to elaborate on this. One is, the fact is that he is praying to the Father. As, oh Father, glorify me with yourself. Here we have the case for Trinitarianism over modalism because uh, it seems to indicate that there's two distinct uh, persons. Okay? Then the second part is glorify glory which I had with you before the world was. The Bible says that all the glory is for God and that God does not share his glory. Anyway. And yet, and that Jesus is claiming here in his prayer to the Father that he had the glory all along with the Father. Glory is shared between them. Okay, if anybody wants to elaborate any more on that, just leave a hand or something or start speaking. Well, it's a, a, a clear attribute for uh, his divinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is actually, uh, this and other verses like it, when I've talked to Mormons, uh, Latter-day Saints in the, in the past, they like to bring up verses like this as a proof text against what they think is the Trinity. But in my experience, most of them think the, the, when they think the term the Trinity actually refers to modalism or oneness. So that, I just thought I'd throw that out there because I've, I've been taken to this verse and others by them. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who have not seen the first couple episodes, modalism is a way of looking at Jesus as God uh, rather than the Trinity. Modalism says Jesus is God Almighty, uh, and he transforms himself uh, into the Father sometimes or into the Holy Spirit sometimes. So they believe Jesus is God Almighty, but he just turns his forms and operates in different modes. He, he manifests himself sometimes in the flesh, the sun, and sometimes he manifests himself in another mode. So the, the distinction with modalism is they give Jesus full credit for being God Almighty, uh, but they do not uh, acknowledge that they are three distinct persons in the Godhead that, uh, that uh, exist simultaneously. Only one exists at a time. Whereas a Trinitarian would believe that um, there is one God, Jesus is God Almighty, the Father is God Almighty, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God Almighty, and they are three distinct persons, yet one God, they exist simultaneously. So when I say that Jesus is praying to the Father, uh, we would have to say that if he's praying to the Father as himself, then he, maybe he was schizophrenic. As it's like a person is talking to themselves, you know. He, otherwise, Otherwise, why would he pray to the Father as being a different person if he, if he himself was the Father? Uh, so, as we've been going through this study so far, uh, we find verses that seem to support modalism and other, other verses that seem to support Trinitarianism, and we're kind of discussing and reviewing them. I, I, see, I see the biggest flaw in modalism is that we have these examples of Jesus praying, having a conversation with the Father. We have an example at the baptism where we have the Father speaking down above Jesus. This is my beloved Son. We 
have Jesus being baptized. We have the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, says the Bible says he ascended uh, in the manner of a dove above Jesus. So you have all three persons of the Godhead all existing at the same moment in time, separate, uh, distinct. And um, so those are the reasons I have a problem with modalism. Um, so this verse here covers modalism and also the fact that God does not share his glory, and yet Jesus says he and his Father share in the glory. Okay? Yes. And and, and we would, we've, uh, just for the people who haven't been here uh, in the past uh, couple of uh, sessions, we suggested that the modalist who uh, uh, believes Christ, Jesus only doctrine, uh, probably are are legitimately saved in Christian, as opposed to the uh, uh, monotheist who uh, deny the person of Christ. Well, I, that's my opinion, and Brother Joseph, I guess that your that's your opinion. Uh, I know some beloved saints that would argue, no, if they're not you're not Trinitarian, they can't possibly really be a Christian. But uh, that's not something. I, to me, the issue is uh, if someone says, no, Jesus is not just a prophet. No, Jesus is not just an angel. Jesus is God Almighty. Now, how do you, how do you explain it through modalism or through Trinitarianism is not the issue for me. The issue is, do you believe he is God Almighty? He is eternally God yeah. Almighty. That's yeah, the issue. Okay. Jackson, were you saying something? Oh, yeah, I was just uh, ag agreeing with, with both you and Joseph on this issue personally as well. And okay. uh, also for... People, I guess I'll add another thing for the people who haven't watched the other episodes, because in the first episode, we distinguished between the theology of oneness or modalism from the leading churches that teach it, like the UPCI and stuff, and, where, and we would have divisions with them over other issues, like the fact that they believe in baptismal regeneration and stuff like that. Yeah, very good point. Now, I saw Joseph raise his hand. I know Ronnie probably has something to say, too. Ronnie, let's go with you first. Anything, any comment on this? No? Okay, Joseph? Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, throw in an amen there for Jackson, uh, what he was saying. I, usually, the people who are of modalistic thought, uh, while they can be correct in, uh, in their belief in Jesus and be saved, we invariably, because of the, the maybe it's because of the uh, confusion as to the uh, person of God, uh, they have other issues that uh, right. really do bring into question a, a greater uh, uh, question of salvation. For instance, baptism and works being part of salvation. Now that I have a real problem. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I think we always need to never just assume if somebody has one theological position, just because most people who hold that position are in another camp, it's not fair to just throw them in there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, what about the question of the glory in this verse? Anybody, anybody think that this is important as I, as I think it is, that Jesus is actually claiming that he deserves to share the glory with the Father. It, it's the it's the clothing of divinity. Who who has the right to share the glory with the Father? The Son. Only the Son, or the Holy Spirit, because only God deserves the glory. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on to the next verse. This is First Timothy, three sixteen. And if you have a parallel Bible, well, maybe maybe I better get it up in parallel Bible. First uh, Timothy three sixteen. Okay, I'm going to read this in. Uh, KJV first. Okay. Uh, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. 
Okay. Now, there's a lot of interesting things in this verse here. Um, but first, let me point out the fact that none of the other, none of the modern translations say God is manifest in the flesh. If you read them, I'm going to go one at a time. NESB says, He who was revealed in the flesh. It says, He who was revealed in the flesh. Now, He doesn't specifically say it's God. It doesn't even specifically say it's Jesus. And then it says in the NIV, He appeared in a body. Okay? He appeared in a body. Well, it doesn't say God appeared in a body. Um, and then in the, here's a NLT, as a paraphrase, it says Christ appeared in the flesh. Christ appeared in the flesh. But only in the uh, KJV does it say the word God. God was manifest in the flesh. This is an important distinction because when you say he was manifest in the flesh, um, or Jesus, even Jesus was manifest in the flesh, it doesn't come out and clearly declare that God was manifest. Uh, you see the distinction there and the importance of it? Uh-huh, definitely. Okay, so here we have a case. We just went in the last verse, uh, or previous verse, we talked about uh, at the trial uh, how uh, the KJV was, was a little bit uh, not quite as clear. And then in this case, we have a case where the modern translations are, there's a real problem in my eyes, because it doesn't specifically say God was manifest. Uh, now, first let's start with this first phrase, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What do we get out of that? Eve, since I can't see you waving your hand, I'm guessing you might say something. Um. Well, I don't know. I would say, I would think, I mean, the Godhead, the, uh, the, the Godhead comes to mind when I read that part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what about this part here, and without controversy? What does it mean if there's no controversy? <laughs> there's no debate. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we can all agree on this. We can yeah. all agree on this is basically what it's saying. There's no controversy over this. Great is the mystery of godliness. Or I can rephrase and say godliness is mysterious. So that's why when you give someone like a modalist or a Trinitarian or, and we, or someone who, uh, some on the panel, uh, like Brother Mitch, he says, I don't want to be labeled. You know, we, uh, how do we uh, explain this Godhead? The fact there's one God, that Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there's one God. How do we explain that? This is a mystery. We all agree on that. There's no controversy. Uh, so, I've said many times before that the, the Trinity is, uh, there's a lot of ways people try to explain the Trinity. Uh, I, and I have my favorite way of explaining it, but even then, it's, it's lacking, it's not perfect. And, and it's, it's just hard to put into words or really comprehend how this how this actually works. So great is the mystery of godliness. And anybody else want to elaborate on that before we go on to the next phrase? I, I'd like to. I'd like to. Oh, well, go ahead, Ron. I'm sorry. Ryan? Well, I would say. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's uh, we are, we are we have finite minds. We are the creation. We're trying to describe the creator, you know, with an infinite mind, uh, an infinite being. We are creations. We are different kinds: the human kind, the animal kind, uh, the dirt, the earth kind. But God is the one kind creator over all, and manifested to my understanding, at least my puny little mind, as being in three persons, but yet one God. Uh, I see the Father as almost like the administrator. Uh, the Son, like, who, who uh, I, I hate, I don't want to use the terminology, but it's the best I can probably think of as 
uh, the foreman or the supervisor, and the Holy Spirit is that which does the work. The thought, the idea, the plan, Father, the Son speak, or the Father speaks, and the Son speaks it out. And the Holy Spirit, like in the beginning, when the Holy Spirit was over the waters, in the beginning was vibrating, you know, ready to create. I can't, I cannot comprehend God being only one being and looking at, like you brought up, uh, when John <clears throat> baptized Jesus. Uh, it's, it's impossible for my little mind to comprehend anything different. Okay, well see, uh, brother, you did a very good job expressing that, and yet we struggle. We struggle to even express it because it is a great mystery, this godliness. And, uh, uh, now, Joseph, you have raised your hand. What were you going to say? Well, I, I uh, always refer back to uh, something I heard. A, a hero of mine is uh, Walter Martin. I'm sure you're, you know, him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and he said something that always stuck with me. Uh, we, well, we can't always comprehend. Volume, volume, volume down again. Yeah. What, what Every I'm time saying. that goes up, then you get a lot of feedback. While we uh, can't always comprehend, we, can, we, we certainly can apprehend. And, and the Word of God gives us the ability to accept, if not understand. And uh, through faith in what we do know and what we do see clearly, we uh, may still not be able to comprehend, but we can apprehend and we can believe what the Word says because it proves itself in so many other ways that are easy to comprehend. We just have to lay faith in this apprehension. As to the verse you're reading right now, verse 16, uh, to me it almost seems like it's a not a spiritual controversy. It, it's like uh, the heavens and uh, and the earth uh, recognize uh, Christ's divinity. Uh, it talks about the angels. It talks about uh, the spirit uh, proving it and the Gentiles receiving it. Okay. I really liked what you said about comprehend versus apprehend and faith because uh, really it, everything in, in our Christianity really boils down to faith. And uh, I have a video called Faith. I forgot what it's called. I think maybe it's just Faith. Oh, oh Faith the One Requirement is the name of the video. I, I talk in great detail of what, what faith is. and, and uh, the, I, the, That's really what it boils down to. I mean, we can study, we can look at science, we can look at prophecies, we can do all the biblical apologetics and everything else, but we can try to prove our case to someone else and even prove it to ourselves. And yet, uh, in the end, uh, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith. And so um, we just have to, and I like the word trust, even though, even though necessarily maybe I don't really understand everything, and it may not, I not be have complete understanding, I don't comprehend it, I'm going to apprehend it, I'm going to grab a hold of it, and embrace it anyway. That's faith. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and I actually you? like, excuse me. Let's go, uh, ladies first, Eve. Yes. Uh, well, I was just going to say, um, you with what you and Jay said, I really agree, because you don't have to fully understand something to trust in it. You don't have to fully understand something to rely. You don't have to fully understand to believe. Right. And you know what? As much as we think, even if we think we do understand, what do we really understand? What do we really know? Uh, I think Einstein uh, was quote him as saying that uh, he didn't know 1% of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, if you look at, if you look at everything there is to know, that's our missions. Well, we don't know 1% of nothing, really. So but what we do know, we, we just need to trust Jesus for, for the rest of it. Put our hands in our, uh, grab all his hand and trust him to take us where he promised. Uh, okay, uh, Jackson, you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah, but and just, to, just to add another label, and some, some may not like this label and think it's derogatory, but I'd say Christianity is believism, actually. Like, you know, the, the, the Lordship people like to say that the uh, free grace theology is easy believism, quote-unquote. Well, 
for setting aside whether it's easy or hard, I definitely say it's believism, and I, I that label just speaks so clear to me. Um, even though some other people might not like it, even though it is kind of a made-up word, I still really think it's encompassing of what I think things boil down to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, can I say something on that too? Yeah. Um, you know, with the whole easy believism, um, I find it easy now, but at first it wasn't, uh, I don't know why they call it easy, because I I think that it's hard to put your full trust in anything. So um, to put your full trust in Christ, and, and I'm referring more to my sanctification, it took a, a lot for me to realize that I had to fully trust him even with my sanctification. With the salvation it's simple, but it's when it comes to sanctification and all things, uh, it's hard to just give it all over to the Lord. So I you know the whole easy believism I, I find as a cop out. Yeah, I think that your uh, this whole idea of believism and then and calling it easy believism. I made a video titled Easy Believism. And I basically, my conclusion was that if it's so easy, why can't you do it? Uh, you know, appar apparently, as you as you expressed it, it wasn't so easy for you to become a believer. You had a lot of doubts and questions and stuff, and then finally, you believed. It wasn't so easy. But the fact is, that it's easy believism. The easy part is that that's all that's required. Once you finally believe, nothing else is required. When you believe yeah. Jesus is your Savior, then, then nothing else is required. But coming to that conclusion and putting your trust in Him completely, then that's the hard part because uh, obviously a lot of people can't do it because they, they want to add, um, uh, add themselves to the formula. Uh, yeah, Ronnie? Well, I also think, am I on? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. I also think uh, the devil uh, blinding people you know, on this earth you know, with the worldly thinking, like there's never a free ride anywhere. You know, we get nothing for free. Um, whatever we get, we have to pay for somehow. We're used to that kind of mindset. Uh, women get hurt by men. Men get hurt by women. You know, that, that there's a lot of mistrust in life. So when we come to bring them somebody who is God in the flesh, I believe Jesus Christ who came, because uh, I can't see just a plain man dying for all the sins of the world. Just, uh, just couldn't have happened. Uh, however, Jesus Christ freely, he laid down his life. Nobody took his life. I had to speak to a man yesterday about, you know, why did God kill his son? God didn't kill his son. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Uh, now, that's hard for people to comprehend. Why would God, if there's really a God, love us that much and freely give his, his, his <coughs> life on the cross like that? and get buried and raised again for our sakes. They look for something they have to pay for somehow. So uh, the free righteousness that Christ offers us also, that's hard for them to comprehend because nothing's free. You know, in this world, this is a fallen world and nothing's free. I think that's what uh, hurts a lot of people and keeps them from believing. And instead of uh, facing their hurt, facing their fears, facing their sin, they'd run to laugh it off, push it away, and hope for the best. Well, and working for what you get, as far as the physical world, it works. That concept works. Even It's even biblical that we, we have to work to eat. Uh, so, you know, it works as far as the physical world, and people try to apply that to the spiritual. And um, I just wanted to make sure that the panel and the audience know that I wasn't ref referring to salvation because it was very easy for me to trust in Christ as far as salvation uh, because I believed his word but when it came to sanctification and my growth I always felt like I had to do this I had to do that I had to change myself instead of trusting in, in Christ to do that within me yeah and, and to be clear I wasn't trying to uh, to diminish anything hard about believing or believing for anyone for that matter my point was actually just whether it's easy or hard, it's definitely believe, if that makes sense. Yeah. Amen. We, we Amen all to that. Okay, uh, now let's move to the next part of the same verse. It says, God was manifest in the flesh. Now, 
um, this is a wonderful idea, this is what we believe in, and yet this would be, I think, a proof text for a modalist. Because a manifestation is the same thing as a, um, uh, let's say, a, appearing in a, mo a particular mode of operation. You know? So if, let's say that God's existing as, as the Father, and then he decides to operate in the mode of the Son, he manifests himself in the flesh as the Son. So you can see how this verse here, <coughs> a, a modalist would have, could embrace that. And it looks like he's transforming himself into a man. Can I bring up a question? Yeah. And, and it may be a little bit of a controversial question. Is it possible that it could occur at the same time? What could occur? Um, as far as like modal modalism, um, I don't know particularly. I haven't really looked into that. But is it possible that uh, just as the verse that I brought up last week, where Christ was present, but He also said He was in the heavenly? Uh, so is it possible? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, but don't we understand that uh, God is also everywhere? But I can yeah. see where she's coming from in a way because it's almost like an interdimensional thing, right? Isn't it kind of? Yeah, um, this is another thing that we were, uh, I think we've got into this last time also about dimensions. The fact if God is omnipresent, uh, was Jesus omnipresent? Is Jesus omnipresent? Obviously, Jesus in the flesh. It seems to me he has to exist in one place at a time in the flesh. Uh, but then if I say that, I, I'm limiting what God can do, so I don't, I don't know if I should say that. Well, but in what, that verse, that sorry, Luke, I didn't mean to cut you off. That verse that I posted last week seems to say that he was present in the flesh, but yet uh, in the heavenlies. In the yeah, heavenlies. it does. It does. That's a very good point. Ronnie, were you going to elaborate further on that? Yeah, I would think that uh, we know that the Holy Spirit was in him. The Holy Spirit is uh, actually connected to the Father. And another reason I think it's easier for me to believe in the triunity of God is since God was from eternity, uh, God would be by himself, talking to himself all this time. No, he had a son. And they were communing together by a spirit of love for all that eternity, planning this all for us. So. Yeah, we did uh, discuss that idea of, in one of the previous uh, parts of this study, the idea that if God is love, uh, love has to have an object. Therefore, there had to be um, a trinity, or at least a duality. There has to be more than one, so that one can love and the other is the object of love. Yes. Sorry, uh, I didn't hear that one. I didn't um, hear that one. Uh, can any, did anybody else hear me, or was it just him? Yeah, I heard you. Uh, okay, I heard okay. okay, so if Rodney, it was just you, so turn your volume up a little bit. But the idea is, I'll repeat it briefly. Uh, the Bible says that God is love, and and uh, love uh, can only exist if there's an object for the love. So therefore, if God could not exist in a singularity because he then would not have an object. So the Father would have to have the Son as an object and vice versa. That it would at least have to be a duality, if not a if not a triunity, for there in there to be an object for God being love. And Brother Joseph, uh, Luke, I, I would refer back to the passage, and I'm embarrassed I can't remember where it's at. But uh, at one point in the in the Gospels, it says that Christ laid down his divine attributes uh, and and covered himself with flesh, so that we may know God. Well, if you're a modalist. And uh, you can't explain Christ laying down or taking off the clothing of divinity to embrace flesh. Uh, he would that 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 clearly states that he is an individual within God. Uh, otherwise, he couldn't lay down his divine attributes. Uh, I bring up the verse where it said, uh, "Nobody knows when uh, when I will return. Only the Father knows." Well, that shows that Christ had laid down the not, not that he never knows when he's coming back. It's just while on earth he had to lay down his divine attributes. Well, if there was a modalist way of thinking, that would be impossible with that. Yeah, yeah. 
There's a lot of problems with modalism, but you can also see each time I we encounter a verse that the modalist could use. I say, you see how modalists could use this verse, and yet we still see there's, there's problems with modalism, even though they have some verses that seem to support it. If you just take it by itself. Uh, well, what did Jesus do then when he prayed? I mean, who was he praying to? Did he jump? You know, from here to there? I, I can't comprehend it. <laughs> it just it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't. Agreed. Okay, so now we'll move on uh, to Isaiah 9 6. I'll read it. For unto us, by the way, this is Isaiah. Uh, I think Isaiah wrote um, 700 years, 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah wrote. And so this is a pr prophetic writing by the prophet Isaiah uh, about this child that would be born. It's, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There's a lot in here, isn't there? Uh, so let's let's start off with the very first part of this. For unto us a child is born. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I became a Christian before I uh, studied prophecies, uh, apologetics, and learned to defend the Bible and so on. I, I just believed, and they didn't have anything to back it up on. It's just faith. Uh, and then over the years I studied and I found out there's, oh, there's all kinds of evidence supporting my belief. I didn't even know that. Uh, but th this is, prophecy is one of the things that we can use to prove that the Bible is the Word of God, that God wrote it, that only God can uh, tell us the future with 100% accuracy. So this is a prophetic verse talking about unto us a child is born, talking about the birth of Jesus in the future. Uh, unto us a son is given. Uh, so let's stop right there and see if anybody wants to elaborate on both points. Well, I'd like to go back all the way back to Genesis and start at uh, uh, chapter 3. Uh, it's Roman, what, verse 15 is the seed of the woman uh, would come. That was a promise of God uh, <clears throat> that Jesus would come uh, in the flesh one day. Yeah, as well, the Antichrist somehow in the future, maybe even in the near future. Uh, but that's what I see, and I also see, of course, when uh, Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, uh, he was uh, the angel Gabriel told Mary that uh, God would come upon Jesus and that uh, she would give birth to a son, and he was called his name Jesus. And back in, uh, I think it's Isaiah two, he says. Uh, Shall we give, or Emmanuel, you know, God with us. There's so many promises laid out in, in the Old Testament and in the New, you know, towards our Savior coming, that God in the flesh will come and be with us to save us. That was that first promise we had in Genesis 3.15. It's fulfilled yeah, in Christ. That's the first reference. I think you went back to the earliest point to uh, point out this coming Savior, this child, this Son of God. Um, Eve, do you want to say anything about that? Um, no, I'll wait till we get to the. Uh, are we just talking about for unto us a child is born, or are we no, talking no, about the entire just verse? That, just that part for now. I'm going to move on to okay. the next. Time. Joseph, anything to say about for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given? Well, it it, uh, it that's you know a, a small thing, and and yet it's uh, it encapsulates it encapsulates the entire uh, Bible. Uh, he that is the promise of the salvation of mankind. Okay, I want uh, Jackson. Anything on that? Uh, not other than what's already been stated. Okay, then let's let's skip a few points and just go to this point that says, uh, "And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace." Uh, 
I had someone tell me once that there's another verse saying his name will be, he shall be called Emmanuel. And you say, you see, it says his name is going to be Emmanuel, and yet his name was Jesus. So they don't, the guy didn't understand that, uh, that the Emmanuel means, uh, he shall be called Emmanuel, means he shall be called uh, God with us. Uh, but the point is that these things here, um, he will be called, you know, his name, Shall be. These are names for him, uh, just as we're going to go, probably not today, but in another episode, I've got a, probably like 50 different titles. And it's also like names for Jesus, kind of interchangeable concept. But here we have this point we're saying he is the, the mighty God. Let's talk about that one first, the mighty God. Well, and, you know, may, maybe people see it's wrong for me to think of it this way, but um, I see it, you know, everybody pe keeps talking about it being them being separate, uh, but I see them as actually being the same, one and the same, and being one. Um, although it's hard for the human mind to wrap around it. I wouldn't call myself a oneness person, and I could, wouldn't call myself a Trinitarian or a modelist. It's just hard for me to explain how I see it. But he's also called the Everlasting Father in this passage. Well, before we move on to that, let me let me you, uh, discuss your choice of words uh, separate. Uh, it was an earlier episode we weren't here at the time where we made a point that a Trinitarian. Um, we, we have to think in the terms of uh, three distinct persons. We don't want to think in terms of three separate persons. Right, so, I remember that show. Yeah. So, so what what is the what is the difference between distinct and separate? Uh, if, if, if we say there are three separate persons, then we could rightly be accused of polytheism. Rather than believing in one God, we're believing in three gods. And that's what a Muslim would say, or that's what a Mormon would say, or, or, or some people would say that this Trinitarian is polytheism. So we have to make sure we don't use the word separate, or we're, we're open to that uh, accusation. But distinct means that they are distinct rather than just this oneness of it, just all one thing, one God that changes forms. Three distinct persons that exist simultaneously and have eternally and always will and yet, we only have one God. So how do you explain that? Well, Ronnie tried to explain it earlier, and it was not easy. I've tried to explain it. Um, people have been trying to explain this for a long time, and that's why it's called, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. We're all at a loss for words to come up with a great explanation for how this can be possible. But when we use the word separate, then you're, you're just sticking out your chin and saying, hey, call me a polytheist. It's okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, but even, even if you were completely on the side of modalism, you don't have to apologize to me for that. Maybe some people will uh, they deem that you're uh, some kind of a heretic or something if you dare to express that. But I'm just saying, we... we we all are, have, are trying to find a way of understanding and uh, expressing this. It's not easy. Right. But let, we're, now we're talking about the idea that he ha his name is the mighty God. The mighty God. Let's just focus on that one idea. Hey, Ronnie? Okay, I'm going to go to the opposite end <laughs> of Scripture in uh, Revelation 1 8. It says, I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And the verse before that said, Behold, he cometh with, every, with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, let it be. And then that verse comes, and that's Jesus. That's the Lord okay. Jesus. Let me, let me tell you what I'm trying to uh, really list this. Clarify, and let's let's kind of ratchet this down okay. so that we can uh, be sure see where the problem is and get clarity on this. The idea of um, Jesus being 
the mighty God, which is another way of saying God Almighty. That is the important thing that I think that we must come to this conclusion. I don't think a person necessarily has to understand that in order to get saved, but in order to be correct and know Jesus, know who Jesus is, and worship him, we have to be able to know he is Almighty God. He is Yahweh. He is Jehovah God Almighty. And that means that I've had Roman Catholics I've witnessed to, and uh, they, they, when I say something like that, they're all up on arms saying, well, no, well, we believe in the Trinity, but we believe Jesus is the Son of God. He's not God. He's the Son of God. Uh, really? They, yes. So really? some people think that this, there's a distinction between God and the Son of God is not really God at all. He's the Son of God. We showed earlier verses that we discussed that the Son is equal to the Father, fully God, uh, the same substance of God, the essence of God, and fully God, serving of all the glory of God. And here it says he is the it is the mighty God. And then another point argument we would have is with Jehovah Witnesses. In John chapter one, they rewrote their Bible saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Yeah. They, they do not want to acknowledge that this God, Jesus God, is not the God Almighty. They want to somehow reduce him down to something yeah. less. And so here we have in this verse saying that Jesus is the mighty God. So what is what is a Jehovah Witness or a Roman Catholic going to deal, deal with that when they say, well, I thought he was just a son or I thought he was just a God? No, he's the mighty God, which means he is God Almighty, Jehovah Yahweh. Hey, Joseph? Go ahead, Eve. Well, and I think that that's where I've gotten the view of Trinitarian <clears throat> Trinitarianism is from the Roman Catholic view, which what they're really doing is separating um, Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I I'm a little bit confused, actually, Eve, because you, I know you don't care for the label uh, Trinitarian, but it seems like all the theology I've heard seems to kind of back that, that position up. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, teach, uh, I, I think, officially teaches the same thing as the Trinity, but I, I've noticed a lot of Catholics don't even really know exactly what their church teaches on this point, so... Well, the the way that I see it is that God is spirit, and I see Christ as the essence of God, and the Holy Spirit as well. So I, I don't know if that explains it. Like I said, it's hard for me to explain the way that I have uh, always kind of viewed it. Well, I feel like, I, I think there might be a little bit of misunderstanding on my end, too, because it just seems like that that's what a Trinitarian believes. It's hard for me to distinguish your point well, of view, Trinitarian view. Well, I think the reason for the misunderstanding is because I've always thought that a Trinitarian viewed Christ, God, and the Holy Spirit as separate beings. Yeah, no, definitely not. No, separate in person, um, in the complete agreement at all times, except for when uh, the Lord Jesus Christ became a man and was the perfect man and lowered himself, allowed himself to be lowered, even in the angels, to become a man. Uh, and so he was still a man at the same time, God, but he lowered himself under the Father in complete obedience to help us understand how to obey also <clears throat> the Holy Spirit. Um, that's how I see that. Now, I had a problem with the fellow yesterday. Why I got angry is because he didn't believe. I have no problem with Mogulus, by the way. I, I believe in one God, too. Uh, however, this fellow uh, didn't believe Jesus was God at all. Uh, and uh, that's what got me angry. I don't think he was a brother. <clears throat> Again, so. Hey, hey uh, uh, I'm going to. I, I've said this in some of my previous videos. So this may not be new to you some of you watching, uh, but I'm going to give you my best attempt to try to explain this idea of Trinity. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to go right to the verses, I'm going to paraphrase this. Uh, but in Genesis, uh, the Bible says, uh, God is speaking, and God says, let us 
make man in our image. And therefore, since we have this plural rather than singular identity expressed in that verse, let us, plural, doesn't say, uh, I will make man in my image. It said, let us, plural, make man in our image. So a Mormon takes that verse and says, see, there's a plethora of gods. There's billions of gods, trillions of gods. There's a, there's a council of gods. Uh, so they, they would take that verse, but I say, no, this is the first indication of the trinity or the triunity of God expressed in the Bible, the beginnings of it. So you got, let us, I'm going to get, let you answer this, write, write, write your thought down real quick, Ronnie, so you don't forget, because this is going to take me a minute to explain this. Uh, let us make man in our image. And then, uh, it, then God created man as uh, body, soul, and spirit. Now, as I look at Brother Joseph here, uh, I see uh, an image of Joseph in the flesh, and I think that's Joseph. Uh, I, and uh, yet, I know that Joseph's real identity is his soul, his consciousness. That's his identity of who he is, his thoughts, his memories, his consciousness, his mind, his soul. And yet, I know that he had a spirit that was severed from God at birth uh, and dead, and then he got born again, and now his spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit. So he's united. He's uh, born again as a child of God. So now he's, he, I know that there's these three persons in, within, within uh, Joseph himself. There's Joseph the flesh, and there's Joseph the soul, and there's Joseph the spirit, and yet there's only one Joseph. So I would agree with that. <laughs> that's the best I can do to try to explain this, and I'm sure that someone could say, well, there's holes in there. Well, fine, that's the best I can do. <laughs> uh, you were going to say something. Ronnie, you were going to say something, then Joseph I raised his hand too, I think. Or maybe, I think he just gave me a thumbs up. Ronnie? Are you talking, Ronnie? We can't hear you. I think Ronnie's muted. Here we go. You guys okay? Go, okay? All right, in the first verse of the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word God there is Elohim, and that's plural. Oh, yeah, excellent point. That's a very good point. I wish, I wish Brother Mitch was with us again today. Yeah, I, I do, too. Uh, I know <laughs> I'm he listening has, to him. He's great. I, I have a playlist that I titled uh, uh, Brother Mitch, Interesting Insights. <laughs> I've collected probably 20 of some of his videos because he comes up with interesting insights on things that uh, a lot of us miss. So I, I missed him today. I think he'll be back with us next week. He has some, some problems to deal with today. So, uh, okay, uh, let's ask see, Joseph or Jackson. I'm used to saying anything about this before we go to that part. Uh, I'll I'll go ahead and go first. Okay, Jackson. Uh, I, I just I just uh, keep referring back to uh, Revelations where. Uh, it discusses the two thrones, and there's an actual physical manifestation anyway, and I realize God is one in substance and essence, but there is an actual physical manifestation of two thrones, one for the Father, one for the Son. The Holy Spirit's not incarnate in any way, but that that is a, a while being one, and I'm a Trinitarian, so I believe in one God. There is a manifestation of two thrones. Yeah, good point, Jackson. Yeah, um, to not to not sound like a broken record, my my spin on it is, you know the the the, ma the mathematical concepts that we have of three and one and and, and, and distinct and, and all these things that we have I think we have to remember that God is the author of these laws and everything and the author of logic itself and everything and so therefore being outside of being outside of that is not something I, I, I see as being absolutely impossible when we're talking about the Trinity yeah well, especially as science, uh, as much as we've advanced in science, we're still, we're still understanding that the more we know, the, the less we know. Right. Now they know that 
people thought there was like uh, uh, three dimensions, heights, widths, and depths. And they said, now there must be a fourth dimension of time. And then they said, now, now I think they're saying that there's 12 dimensions, or they, they've discovered 18 dimensions, or a lot of things. And science is learning more and more. And as they learn more, they really understand that the supernatural, that's maybe how we could understand the supernatural. As we unmoor is revealed from this natural world and we understand and it better, it, that, that used to be what we call supernatural, but now we're understanding how these dimensions of time and space uh, can all be uh, uh, explained, explain these things that we don't understand right now. Okay, let's go to the end of this verse. It says, it says, uh, his name is the Everlasting Father. Now, I'm looking at a Hebrew text analysis of this, actually. Okay, please, go ahead. And uh, it's funny, because uh, just so everyone knows where I'm going and everything, I'm at BibleHub.com, and I've got Isaiah 9-6 in view. You can click on a Hebrew tab, or Greek, if you're looking at the New Testament. And it says, uh, there's like a, like a very literal translation of each word. And I noticed that uh, the everlasting father, or there anything about the father, is, is completely absent from here. Really? Does yeah, it says, it says, like, I'll, I'll read it. This will be kind of, this will be kind of butchered, but it's this as close to a liter, literal translation of possible. It says, for a child will be born, a son will be given, will rest, and the government on his shoulders will be called his name, Wonderful Counselor, God Almighty, or no, sorry, not Almighty, God Mighty, Eternal Prince of Peace. Eternal. They, so they say eternal rather than the everlasting Father. Right, uh, it says eternal. It does, does anybody have a, a parallel Bible in front of you? My parallel Bible is only New Testament here, because uh, it has eight different translations, so it, to cover all of it would have to be like 15 inches. Yeah, Bible, at BibleHub.com, there's an online parallel Bible that anyone can use, and that's what I was using for this Hebrew text analysis. Yeah. Uh, well, I use a very, those programs too, but I don't want to try and access it now, so I thought maybe someone had it. But the Everlasting Father is, this is the King James Version, and uh, for the a lot of people who uh, are KJV only, we have to be able to explain this uh, from their perspective here. And uh, then, and then um, I know other translations express it differently, but here, here I'll tell you what the, the potential problem is and a, a potential answer. A modalist could say the everlasting Father. You see? It says right here, Jesus is the Father. <laughs> so, end of argument. A modalist says, see? Jesus is the Father. I told you. Jesus said the Father and I are one. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And now, it says right here, the name of Jesus, what his name is, the everlasting Father. So, they can take this to uh, reinforce their argument for modalism, that he is actually one and the same, not uh, a distinct person in the Godhead. Uh, whereas, I don't know if it's in other translations or if the, the answer to that is that the this particular part, the everlasting Father, should be interpreted or understood as he is the Father of eternity because he created time and space. He created everything. So, therefore, Jesus is the Father of Eternity. Anybody familiar with this idea? Or this uh, the problem and the answer? I, I Luke, had never considered this. And, and when I read ahead uh, a few moments ago, I didn't want to interject before we got to it. But it, it did trouble me. And so I, I'm uh, intensely interested in uh, Jackson. Uh, I believe he's got a lexicon there or something that uh, has the original translation. Well, if you read this, in, can anybody read it in NIV or NASV, something like that? Because I just read the Everlasting Father is the King James Version. Read it in one of the can, others. I can switch it over to NIV. Let's see what it says there. It says... For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
Would you like a different version? Yeah, yeah. try NASB. So I don't know if this is uh, answered through a different translation or if it's just a uh, a uh, kind of a scholarly um, commentary that uh, I saw this as the explanation. Um, but rather than understanding it as Jesus is the everlasting Father, some would argue that he's the Father of everlasting or the Father of eternity, the Father of creation, the Father of time. You you said the NASB. Try that one, yeah. Okay. Just read the last part that you were referring to. Actually, Luke, I think there is a lot to what you just said because I'm looking at my Hebrew thing more, and right after the word eternal, like I already mentioned, the father was absent. The next word is prince here, and this is the word that's used in a um, lot of other places. One of which in Genesis 21, where it says and. Fikel or Pickle, or I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, the commander of his army. His UV, this is the chief captain. And all these references are to captains and keepers and masters and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the, the term master of the universe? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Master of the universe, or. Okay. That was really um, interesting. All right. Uh, so you can see that a modalist would grab that and. and uh, also, he grabbed the mighty God and the everlasting Father and say, see, this proves modalism. Uh, and uh, some people say, no, uh, the everlasting Father means he's the Father of eternity, he's the creator. All right, we're going to move on now to Matthew 1, 21 through 23. It says, uh, he will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, so in Matthew, it's talking about uh, the beginning is Matthew making these statements and then referring to the prophet. I believe that's probably Isaiah, or maybe it's I don't know which prophet it is. Does it say any, anybody's Bible footnotes there? When he gets to verse 23, it's, no, it says 22. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Is that uh, Isaiah? Or maybe that's that is our name, Isaiah nine six, the previous verse we just discussed. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so um, he will give birth to a son, and you are to give it, him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. Okay. His name is Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Now, I've spoken about this a lot of times. Brother Mitch talks about this almost every time he gets on a video. He makes the whole point here. So, does anybody want to say what you think this means? It says, give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. My strong says it means uh, Jehovah saves. So the name God, God saves, is with us. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wasn't going to go into this, but I, I guess I maybe I, I feel like I need to go this. Um, a brother that uh, recently made a video uh, that bothered me, and it, he kind of mocked the whole idea of simply call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Uh, and uh, the Bible says, call on the Lord, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't know how a person can mock it, but they did, and acting like, well, that's really not a mock. You're silly to think you can call on the name of the Lord. His name is Jesus, by the way. And then there's other verses that talk about how uh, we're saved by believing in his name. And uh, his name has a meaning, 
and his name is really all we need to know. And, and, uh, and this verse here, uh, it tells you what his name means. As you just elaborated, uh, Ronnie, it's isn't God. That, is, isn't that an act of faith by itself? What? Call upon the name of Jesus. You know, God oh, yeah. saves. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's like, but anyway, it's by grace. Having faith in his name. Amen. Is this enough? A lot of is people say no. Well, if, that, you don't, God if, you don't if we understand what his name means, mm -hmm. and that's what it's expressing in this verse right here, it okay. says, they were told to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And as no. you can out the actual literal translation of his name, Yeshua, or Jesus, is God saves I like to interject. I don't know if this is actually correct, but I think it's God who saves. Jesus is God who saves. And when we call on the name Amen. of Jesus, we're calling on Jesus to be our Savior God. And that's why you see on uh, every video I close and say, bless you in the name of our great Savior God. Because his name, Jesus, means God Savior. So, uh, believing in his name is sufficient. But some people want to argue that believing in his name, in the name of the Lord Jesus, is insufficient, one, because you've got to do some kind of works, or other people argue it's insufficient because that doesn't tell you enough about it. You've got Knowledge, to, yeah. Yeah, you've got to study and know all the facts. You've got to know about the one God. You've got to know about the Godhead. You've got to know about the virgin birth. You've got to know about his um, ministry and his miracles. You've got to know about the death and the burial and the resurrection and the ascension. And you got to understand those things. Some people will condense it into two things and say, he, uh, he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again for, on the third day, and they want to condense it and none of that. But whether they have two or three points or they have a dozen points, they want to say, believing in his name is not enough. You've got to have knowledge of certain facts, and the list of facts varies from person to person, how many facts they require. What I'm saying, no. It, Calling on the name of the Lord Jesus is sufficient, in my opinion. And I will continue to defend that, and that's what it says here. Believe in, give us the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Okay, Eve, what were you saying? I, I just wanted to say, uh, with my opinion, I, I think that it is a heart issue. Um, if the person within is really seeking for truth, if they're really seeking an answer, and if they're really seeking for salvation, I think they're going to find it. Yeah, I think all of the facts a person can gain later. There's a lot I've learned about Jesus and about the Bible after I got saved. I didn't understand all, near as much as I do now, and I still have a lot to learn, but I didn't have to learn all these facts before I could get saved. Um, and yet, there's a lot of people who understand all these facts, and I don't believe are saved. I've given this example probably a dozen times now in my videos, and that is, I could name uh, a group of people that is about one billion strong in the world, about a billion of them, and they believe in all these facts. They believe in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 3, 3 and 4. They believe he died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. In fact, they believe much more. They believe all the facts I just mentioned earlier. And yet I don't believe they're saved because they never called on the name of the Lord Jesus to save them. And these are Roman Catholics. These are people who understand all the facts, and they have mental assent, and they believe, yes, it's true there's one God. I believe it's true that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe it's true he died for his sins, and so on. And yet their faith is divided between this Jesus, this Godhead, and this, and this religion, and following the commandments, and being a good person, and, and yet when they go to the judgment and if they're asked, why should I let you into heaven? They're not simply going to say, Jesus is my Savior. They're going to present their case. I did this. I did that. I went to church. I went to confession. I went to communion. I did all those things. So their, their faith is not based upon the Savior. Their faith is based upon the, what they did instead. So uh, I, uh, I think that uh, the knowledge the only knowledge we have to have is call on the name of the Lord Jesus. When we, as you said, Eve, it's a heart, it's a heart question. If a person's heart reach, ever reaches the point that they understand, my situation is hopeless. Not any religion can save me. 
There's nothing I can do. I can give to charity. I can do all kinds of good deeds. I just don't feel anything is the answer. Jesus, I need you to do it. Call, I call on your name. Jesus, save me. When they come to that point of helplessness, hopelessness, and they call, cry out, uh, just as, as the uh, tax collector did, uh, Lord, have, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now we know Lord, his name is, uh, the Lord's name is Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. When they reach that point and they call on Jesus, they depend on him instead of themselves. That's the state of mind. That's the heart condition that they need to raise. That's the kind of believing. They need. They believe they need Jesus, and they believe Jesus is able. Jesus. Uh, Luke, I've got a question, um, and I'm sorry to throw all these questions out there, um, but I, I just want to know how you feel about someone who has never even heard of the name Jesus, has never heard the gospel, uh, yet their heart is relying on um, God. They know that there is a God, and their heart is relying on God. It, I would, I, I would have to stick to the Bible. I'm not going to. Go, I'm not going to do what Joel Osteen did, okay. or what Billy Graham did when they're interviewed by Larry King and so many others, famous uh, pastors and teachers. They say, "Well, I don't know about that. I'm sure God will be fair, or whatever." I'm going to say what the Bible says. The Bible says, uh, whosoever believeth in the Son hath life, whosoever uh, believeth not on the Son shall not have life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The Bible says, if you believe on Jesus, you're not condemned. If you do not believe on Jesus, you are condemned already. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I, I want to stick with the scriptures and say, that person is lost. But what comforts me is I am an annihilationist. I don't think that person is going to go to hell and be burned and tortured ever and ever and ever. Yeah. I believe they die. And that gives me comfort thinking that John, God's not going to be unfair to that person and torture them forever because they never called on Jesus. Okay? Yeah, Ryan? Well, we know God doesn't lie, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. We all agree with that. And uh, God said, and if that sentence says, For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Or in Acts, uh, yeah, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that name, I mean, they didn't name their kids like we do nowadays because the name sounds cool or something. They named their names of their children for what they meant. And I believe that Jehovah saves Jesus, Yeshua, encompasses everything about him, everything he did. Now, I, I believe I heard an analogy of yours once where you said a car is going over a cliff. And off in the distance, they saw this, this mission where a cross was there saying, Jesus saves. On the way down, oh, they got they, their heart was pricked. And they called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. I, I believe with all my heart that person's in heaven. He, I don't care what he did before that, prior to that. The name of Jesus covers, I believe, everything he did. It's like if you talk about a car. You know, yeah. oh, that's a car. That's going to take you somewhere. Okay, that's called a car. And you know that you can have faith that that's going to take you somewhere else. Yeah. Now, what, what the, 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 the question here is not, should we tell people about this um, trinity, uh, this deity of Christ? Uh, should we tell them about his virgin birth and he died for our sins and rose from the dead? Of course, we should tell them as much as they're willing to listen. If they're patient and they want to listen, I'm never going to neglect to just tell someone one little thing and then say, that's all I'm going to tell you. Unless they're passing by and I have three seconds. If I have three seconds, I say, call on the name of the Lord Jesus. He'll give you eternal life. Because mm -hmm. I only had three seconds. But if I have a minute, I'll tell them more. If I have five minutes, I'll tell them more. We don't want to neglect to tell them the whole story about Jesus and salvation. But I'm saying in those rare cases where someone uh, didn't have all the facts or had very little facts at all, but simply said, I heard Jesus saves. I need you to save me. I Amen. believe Jesus yeah. is faithful and will save them when they call on his name. Uh, but that, Well, what I if somebody is whacked? whacked? What, what if What's somebody that? is whacked? You know? What if somebody is a little crazy? And they took a bunch of pills and commit suicide. Then they changed their mind, but they knew they were dying. 
and they call on the name of the Lord Jesus, they're saved. Brother, I, I believe you. I mean, I, I agree with you, too, that if we can learn, if there's time to learn, we should learn all we can. It's just like the uh, people say, we, we have a uh, grace teachers uh, give a license to sin. No, we don't. After you get saved, we teach you about sin, what the Holy Spirit can do to guide you, to comfort you, to change you, to discipline you if not necessary. Yeah. Yeah, that's but a very good point you're making there. I think there's a, there's a good analogy between those two ideas, is that... Uh, we don't have to tell them all the theology before someone can get saved, and we don't have to tell them all the theology to, uh, about being sanctified and growing and maturing in order to get saved either. Uh, but those are things that are important that, that a person, we should share with people, and the Holy Spirit should convict them to study the Bible and get into church and learn more about it. Uh, but I've, I've expressed the same concern in numerous other videos so I'm kind of ranting a little bit about it right now because uh, I'm very, very disappointed that this dear saint that I love came out and said such a thing that it was foolishness, that you're mocking the idea that you could simply call on the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. Uh, but the point, it does relate to this point because it's talking about his name in this verse here. You are, give, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins and so that's why he's named Jesus, because he is God who saves. And then we go to the next verse, and, and all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet, I think that's Isaiah, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel literally translates to God with us. So, so what do we say about this name Emmanuel? Someone else talk for a minute, because I don't want to feel like I'm like, uh, monopolizing the conversation. Well, I, I would love to interject that in this tidal wave we're in of the sacred names, that uh, uh, it is, it, it, the God of the Bible is, is who we're talking about. And in China, they may call on Penjing, and uh, God knows who they're talking about. And uh, one last thing, uh, regarding uh, Olstein and, and Billy Graham, I don't want to uh, take up defense, but I do want to lend some understanding. Uh, there is a, a verse in the Bible uh, that, well, a couple, that say uh, we're judged by the light we are given. And uh, so take that into account also. Yeah. Okay. I think those verses do not, do not uh, uh, wash away the clear verses that I cited in my rant <laughs> that that uh, Jesus is the only way. Uh, uh, agreed, agreed. Not not a not a defense. Just just a little understanding as to where they're coming. Okay. Uh, so anybody want to talk about? They will call him Emmanuel. Did, did anybody ever? I thought they called him Jesus. They, they didn't call him Emmanuel. They called him Jesus, right? Well, I, th I think the fact that the, the both names apply to the same person actually is good evidence against the sacred name movement thing, personally. Because, you know, it's the meaning of the name. It's not the syllables you pronounce, it seems like. Yeah. Hey, that's a very good point. I never put that together. Very, very good. Um, Emmanuel, though, uh, is basically, if we didn't use the word Emmanuel, but we just used the word and they will call him God with us. That, then it per perfectly fits. Which the end of it translates, and, says, and it translates to God with us. So they're basically, we're calling him, it says they will call him God with us. And that gets back to everything else we've been discussing, how God was manifest in the flesh. And have, we ever, uh, have we ever considered the facet that it's, it's not uh, who we believe in as much, well, it is who we believe in, but it's also who draws us. Uh, in order to accept the Lord, we must first be drawn by the Holy Spirit. And so when we accept the Lord by whatever name uh, we call him, whether it's Pin Jane or Jesus, uh, it's the drawing of the Spirit to the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can we go on to the next one? Anybody else want to elaborate further on that? Okay, we'll go to Romans 9.5. Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. 
Amen. Uh-huh. Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Um, can, could we be any more clear stating that he is God than this? Could anybody dispute that verse and say, it doesn't say he's God? No, they can just beat around the bush. That's what they would have to do. (laughs) They would have to try to explain it away. It's like I have all these these proof texts for the deed of Christ and faith alone and eternal security. And I could say to someone, uh, Romans 3.28 says, Paul speaking, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Mm-hmm. Now, how could you dispute that? It's saying that's you're just by faith alone. <laughs> that says faith alone. Without the deeds of the law means faith, no works. Okay? And so how could a person dispute that? Well, it's, and the same, it's the same thing here. They can't dispute this either, but they may attempt, but it wouldn't make any sense. Because right. it means what it means. Sorry, Luke, I, I don't mean to keep interrupting, um, but Romans 4, too, I think it's Romans 4, um, I'm, I'm not sure what verse, but Paul also says, to him him who does not work, uh, yet believes, you know, so that, too, oh, is God. really clear. Yeah, there, we have dozens of proof texts for our uh, salvation through faith alone and in the of Christ and eternal security. And these are so clear cut. There's no, there's no answer. But the only thing they can do is ignore it and try to cite another verse. They can't ever refute the true meaning of it because it's so clear cut. And this is one of those clear cut verses that says Jesus is God. Okay. Mm-hmm. Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Okay. Not much else needs to be said about that. I'll move on to John 3:16. Uh, you may be familiar with this one. For God so loved the world that He gave His own, His one and only Son. I guess this is the King James. He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Mm-hmm. So here, in this study, putting this in context, we're talking about the identity of Jesus. Uh, it says he gave his one and only son. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I see four panelists plus me, and I, every one of us can claim that you're a child of God. Amen. He's a daughter. He's a daughter of God. Ronnie's a son of God. Everybody, we're all we're all a child of God, and yet this says Jesus is. Uh, his only one and only son, or only begotten son, one and only son. So here we see that he, Jesus is the Son of God, but it says it's his one and only, and yet we are all, as born again believers, we, we were a child of God. So what what's the discrepancy there? Can I say something? Yeah. Okay, let's. He talks again about his only begotten Son. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now go, go to. Uh, I'm going to go real quickly to read this. In Psalms 2. Uh, he said, He that sitteth on, in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I'll declare the decree. Thou, Lord, hast said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the other, uh, to the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Uh, so here's two people talking. And that's prior to, to uh, uh, Jesus coming upon the earth. What I like also, it goes on later here, in your verse, talking again about the name of Jesus. Uh, he that believeth on, believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, 
because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jehovah God, Yah, Yeshua, saves. Okay, so uh, when we read the first chapter of Hebrews, uh, it also was over and over again and declaring that Jesus is the Son of God. And here we have this verse in John 3.16, that he's the Son of God, the only one and only Son of God, or the only begotten Son of God. And yet, but what I want to ask is, what is the distinction between Jesus being the Son of God, and in fact the only begotten, or the one and only Son of God, and yet, all of us here, we could all claim that we are the Son of we're God. We're adopted sons. Adopted? Yeah, we are the adopted sons. He's the only begotten Son of God, and the firstborn from the dead. Uh, we too are going to share in that inheritance after either. I believe in a rapture, so either at the rapture or at or when uh, God comes to get us, we go home. Um, but the, the distinction, the distinction between the only begotten or the one and only Son of God, and then the rest of us who are uh, born again, child of God. Mm -hmm. uh, you're saying this distinction is we're adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph, yeah. Joseph, Joseph, uh, I would uh, I would go further. I, I agree with that, uh, Ron. I'd go further and say that it's the difference between uh, that which is created and that which is the creator. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, valid point too, uh, Jackson. Huh? Jackson? Yeah. You want to expound on that? Were you with us? Sorry, I, I had to go and, and, and do something for a second. What were you talking okay, about? Okay, let me ask you. The uh, when Jesus is referred to the only begotten Son of God, mm -hmm. God or or we can be rephrased the one and only Son of God, and yet mm -hmm. Jackson is the Son of God through the regeneration, uh, the, the the second uh, birth, uh, the. Um, uh, why uh, Brother Ronnie brought up the distinction is that we are a child of God through adoption, mm -hmm. and, and and Brother Brother Joseph said that also that God Jesus is a Son of God eternally, and we are created. Mm -hmm. we, are created uh, we are created, not eternal Son of God. So do you want to expound upon that any further? Oh yeah, That's sure, not, sure. Yeah. The um, the the thing is. Because Jesus existed eternally, he was God's son before before you and I were. Obviously, he was the he was the only begotten son. I think meaning he was the only one who was originally God's son. Uh, if you change the word begotten to originally there to illustrate my point. In other words, Jesus as it was was God's son from the beginning, I believe. And you know, Jesus came down to earth and lived a perfect life. It seems like theoretically there are two ways to heaven: either be absolutely perfect or believe on Jesus. Obviously, nobody does the first option. I can because nobody is capable of it. So I think that kind of le leads to a distinction between begotten and adopted. If that makes sense. Okay. I kinda, well, uh -huh. I just wanted to say where Jay was talking about. You know, he's the creator. We are the created. Uh, we also have to um, become a new creation in him. So I just wanted to kind of bring that out. Okay, so... Uh, Doesn't it happen the moment we believe? Yes. The moment we believe, we become new creations. So whosoever is in Christ is a new creation. All things have passed away, all things become new. Isn't that immediate? Yes, I believe so, yes. Thank you. I just want to know. So the I, um, I got to go back to the eternity, the eternity of this begotten thing because, like I said in in, ver, in Psalm verse two, this is talking about in the heavens prior to his coming, prior to him becoming a man. I will declare the decree: the Lord has said unto me, "Thou art my son. This day have I begotten." So there is a there is a time when Jesus was begotten. Uh, that's what I see, and, and and when he came, he is that only begotten one who became in the flesh. But the only thing uh, 
that was not God about Jesus was his body was created. God created his body within the womb of Mary. Whereas we are and born on the seat of the woman. So no man had anything to do with that. As for us, we are born of man and woman. We bear that, that, that sin nature from the beginning. Uh, Jesus Christ is God from eternity. Okay. He says he is Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son now. <laughs> so we, we've, we've already uh, settled the issue that uh, Jesus is God Almighty. And Jesus is not created, he's eternal. He's equal to the Father, equally eternal, equal in every way. They, they all operate in certain roles or functions, uh, <laughs> which is agreed upon, but there, he's equally God, and but he's the Son of God is a, maybe a title for him. And yet, you are Son of God, Ronnie, and uh, Eve's a, a child of God, a daughter of God, I guess. And, and yet, we are, are we, do we have, we do not have equal status. Um, the word adopted was used. There's a verse that says that we're adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh, I know that we're also regenerated, which we're recreated. At the time we put our faith in Jesus, our spirit gets regenerated and we're connected to the Spirit of God. And now this barrier between God and man is reconnected. Uh, we have a living, regenerated spirit connected to the Holy Spirit. So now we're a child of God. And yet, are we equal to Jesus? No. No one. No one's going to claim that we're equal to Jesus. No. Even though we've been regenerated and we're a child of God. I, I kind of disagree. Um, I'm not. I don't think that we are Jesus, but I think that <clears throat> just as He said He was one in the Father, now that we are newly created, that we are one with Him. I, I would interject, Eve, that uh, the the verses and and the scripts and scripture that you're referring to, uh, I've struggled with, and I believe uh, that we're equal with him on the uh, side of humanity. He's both God and man, and we're brothers with Christ in his humanity mm -hmm. and uh, creations of Christ uh, in our spiritual side. Well, one uh, thing we know is we cannot be equal to him, even though we're regenerated as a child of God, uh, in that we never have the status of being uh, eternal. We are immortal. That means that we're, we're not going to die. Uh, now we, we are. We have immortality. But mm -hmm. eternality means not only will you never die, it means that you were never born. You're never, you have no beginning. That's eternity. No beginning, no end. Jesus has this standing as being the eternal God Almighty. And he's never going to die, but he's always existed. We came into existence. So in that way, uh, at least in that way and in other ways, we're not, we're not equal to Jesus because we're, we're not eternal. We have eternal life. It goes on and on, but we, our eternal life began. We're also not equal to Jesus in terms of power. Uh, I believe that uh, once we are resurrected and we have our glorified bodies, I think that we're going to have some powers that we don't have now. I think that uh, the, the Bible alludes to the fact that we're going to have bodies like Jesus had after the resurrection. But after the resurrection, he was able to appear in a room without going through a door or a wall. So maybe we will be able to materialize ourselves in place to place. He was also able to change his appearance like a shapeshifter. So as he on the road to Emmaus, uh, they talked to him for a long time, didn't know it was him, and then suddenly he revealed it, and now it's him. They could see it's him. So maybe he, uh, he changed his appearance. So I can see in some ways, if we have those abilities that the resurrected body of Jesus was able to have, then maybe we're going to have some supernatural powers that we don't have now. But I don't see that we're going to be, ever be equal to Jesus in terms of of the power of God, uh, omnipresent, omnipotent, omni omniscient. Okay, how, okay about, how, about, right? how about like right now? Uh, we need the name of Jesus. Let's say you have to do a deliverance session on somebody. Uh, I don't go to that person and, and say, 
to the demon, hey, in the name of Ronnie, get out. No. I go in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's still our authority. And uh, he will always be our authority. In fact, God, God uh, says he's going to be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. There's going to be no one above him. And yet, creation itself calls out, waiting for the, church, the sons of God to appear. So there's some wonderful things ahead for us. I think we're going to be given powers to do things that you know, are unimaginable to us now. But now and forever, Jesus is always going to be our authority. He is God and we are the creation. So does, does, do, we, do we all agree that, that, that uh, Jesus being the Son of God and us being a child of God, these are not equals? Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, a, Mormon, a Mormon would take issue with that and say that no, every person becomes a God themselves and then they have their own planet to be God over and so on. Right. Uh, so they would say that no, you you do eventually become God. Uh, just as they believe that Jesus became a God and the Father became a God, they were once men gods. So no, we're not. I don't believe that we're going to ever become gods. Uh, Dr. Ruckman in that video that you just saw, um, he did the Kingdom of God, the Kingdom of Heaven, speculated that. The universe uh, is so big that God must have a plan for us to occupy it. Maybe we're all going to be spread out over the universe doing something. Um, but, Star Trek. Uh, yeah, it, it, it does. It does seem like uh, the Earth is so tiny in the universe for us to be limited to it throughout eternity is uh, that doesn't seem to make sense in my mind. So maybe there is a much a, a larger plan for man, but I don't. I think we're going to reach the status where we're given a planet we become a god of the planet. Definitely. Okay, oh, maybe uh, a moon. <laughs> okay, let me see. Uh, uh, I think this is a good point to make our closing remarks because I like the show to run no more than two hours. So we'll pick up here where we uh, we left off next time. I still have a lot of verses to go over, and yet. <laughs> After that, we still have many other titles to go over for Jesus. That's going to be a lot of fun, too, I think. Um, but what I'd like everybody to do in conclusion here is one at a time, uh, just tell the audience who you are, the name of your YouTube channel. Uh, hopefully, they'll, everyone will, people will subscribe to each of you. And then also, any final statement about anything we discussed today, then we'll move on to the next person and so on. We'll start with Eve. Well, um, my name's Eve, and my YouTube channel is Eve Well. And I just wanted to, to say to you, Luke, again, that I appreciate you having me, and I, I thought it was great. Um, I think it's good for the um, children of God and the body of Christ to come together and be able to give uh, give our inputs and learn from one another. And um, so I thought it was awesome. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ronnie? Uh, I am Ronnie. I uh, go by Hood Minister because I used to do a lot of ministry in uh, rather bad neighborhoods. <laughs> and uh, so, But I enjoyed it. I loved it. I had never had any fear because the Lord is always good. <laughs> Praise God. Um, um, my, my channel isn't anything. I got one video up there that I think that will bless anybody who sees it and uh, that was my favorite when I found it that's why I threw it up there and I haven't seen anything better yet it talks about God, the love of God for his people, for all of us uh, I'd just like to make one quick remark to say that um, a lot of people just can't seem to trust that God can love them that much that God can not only save them as a free gift and have righteousness as a free gift uh, that your holiness comes from him. Even your faith comes from the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Everything is given to us. If you could just lay down those things that, that hold you back and just believe that Jesus loves you. And, and in First Peter, God talks about he will make sure that you get home to the inheritance you'll have, that he gives you. And any works we do, he does to us. So it's not hard. We just go along for the ride. We rest in Christ. I think that's the difference between us grace preachers and those who struggle to get somewhere. You want to struggle to get anywhere, God says, struggle to enter into my rest. God bless you people. I love you. Amen. In Jesus name. Thank you. Yeah, Ronnie, I 
uh, that was very inspirational. And uh, every time you ever write a comment or a PM to me, I'm always get inspired by a, a beautiful, a beautiful expression uh, that we must remember how much God loves us. Everything we, everything is based upon what He does. His love for us, His sacrifice for us, and then Him indwelling us and transforming us. Uh, he gets all the glory. Um, Brother Joe. <laughs> well, I'm just uh, I'm inspired by by what uh, Ron just said. Also, that was that was really right on the mark. Uh, my channel's Jay Byron. Uh, I'll plug my latest video, uh, "Habitual Sin in Christians." If anyone wants to watch that, uh, I think it was kind of a little bit inspired. Uh, and I'm I'm so glad that you've invited me onto this. I didn't think I could do it, but uh, really have a great time every Sunday. Yeah. All right, brother. I appreciate you you coming the last time, and again, I hope. Uh, you and Eve both continue coming, and uh, it's a great exchange of ideas. And uh, you're you're all saints in more than one way. Not only in your salvation, but also in your attitude towards others. Uh, we don't have to get angry with each other and uh, argue and then separate just because we don't agree 100 percent and everything. And Brother Jackson, thank you so much for having me on the panel, Luke. Um, my YouTube channel is Mecca Wing Zero. I'm I'm a college student and I, I have Asperger's syndrome and I've made only a few videos so far, but I have some plans. I haven't been able to get to do many of them yet because I'm so busy with my classes. I'm in a really hard computer science class right now. But stay tuned nonetheless and I'll try to find time to put up some more things. Okay. All right, uh, the last thing I want to say is if there's anybody watching now who uh, has not embraced Jesus as your Savior, then I'm going to ask you to do it right now. I'm not asking you to join a religion, or I'm not asking you to become a religious person. I'm asking you to trust, trust our Savior, God. Uh, God loves us all so much. He knew we were in trouble because no matter what we try to do, we, we're going to die. We're going to, we're going to die. And, uh, we're lost. And he said, I love my creation so much, I'm going to come to the world and pay for their sins. But Jesus became a man, he died for all our sins. Now the sin problem between man and God is resolved. There's only one problem left. We're all going to die. And Jesus is offering you eternal life right now if you want it. If you want to live forever in the kingdom of God with the saints and God and the angels and do with perfect joy and happiness forever and ever, with thrills beyond our imagination. If you want that, Jesus offers you that as a free gift. Uh, because whosoever believeth in me shall have everlasting life. Put your faith in Jesus. Don't put your faith in your own ability. Uh, don't put your faith in a religion, but trust completely on the Savior. He saves you from death and gives you life forever. So, I'm going to end the show right now, and panelists, so don't run off. We can talk privately after the show's over for a couple of minutes. And uh, uh, so, everybody's watching, and to the panelists, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.